Welcome back to iFish News Fishing Podcast. Your host, Glenn, with the City and Allen Fishing Field Team, COAF Field Team on YouTube. And this round, what we have to talk about, well, we'll continue on with our series with the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. In this case, it's Podcast 33, Episode 14. And specifically, we're going to be talking about tips 50 through 55. And just to recap what they are, number 50, tip 50, finding your mark. Tip 51, the swing. 52, doing the continental, and then 53, 54, and 55, all talk of weighty matters, part one, part two, part three. Okay, so let's uh, jump right into some housekeeping. I know we're going to be doing this from a podcast standpoint, but for those that are on the podcast, just want to describe uh, the video that we have running in the background. So you don't just have to listen to yours truly talking, you can actually see some uh, some action in the field also. Okay, so in the upper left, we have a trip to the Blue River, the catch and release section. I believe that was back in November, and that was a fun time. Uh, so do see that video, and you can note that there's some nice size trout being caught uh, in that catch and release section. And then below that, in the lower left of the uh, corner, We've got some trout being caught over here at our local pond, Bethany Lakes Pond, where it was stocked just last week. And your was able to limit out in this video. So um, take a look at that one while I'm going over those tips from the Little Red Book of Fly Fishing. Upper right, we've got the trip to Denison Dam on the Oklahoma side where we're working basically some bait. Uh, in the current and being able to catch some striped bass. And that one has some eight lessons learned when fishing the Oklahoma side, specifically the Oklahoma wall at Denison Dam. So when you do get a chance, that's another one to look at. There's some good information there that we weren't aware of when we went up there last, like making sure that you have your stringer tagged with your customer ID, aka license number, um, and you can't share a stringer. So guess what? Just like trout fishing in Oklahoma, got to have a stringer also for striped bass. For the individual fishermen and then lastly in the lower right corner is a trip to waterloo uh, up in denison where it was stocked uh, several years ago and i was able to take out the water wolf camera and do some go do some um, underwater well scouting i guess uh, to see which the trout liked better did it like corn did it like power bait um i can't remember which one they liked better anyways it was a fun trip and hopefully we can be able to do it again. I lost that water wolf camera, but I replaced it with a go fish camera. And I'm hoping that, well, guess what? Maybe we can get another view of some trout. Maybe liking corn over power bait or maybe some other things. All right. So let's go right into the tips. Tip 50, finding your mark. Since even the slightest drag can spoil the presentation of a dry fly, it's important to know when this occurs. The best way to know if your fly is moving too fast is to mark another object in the immediate vicinity. A leaf, an air bubble, an insect. If your fly is keeping pace, you're in business. Moving too fast, then it's time to make amend. Well, guess what? I've used this tip often, specifically on that air bubble working a bubble line on a river. Uh, we see that bubble go by. We see our strike indicator go by at the same speed. We're good. If it's going too fast, well, oops, better mend. All right, so I, I like that one, and it's uh, it definitely makes sense to me. Okay, tip 51, the swing. You're fishing nymphs in a run, and just as you get ready to lift up and make another cast, bang, you get a hit. It happens all the time. What you just did is hook a fish on the swing. As the line straightens out down current, the flies inevitably lift toward the surface, which looks exactly like insects emerging. Trout love eating those bugs. Many people have lost touch with the art of wet fly fishing and swinging bugs subsurface. In my family, we had a rule that the little kids had to fish the river with wet flies so they'd work the water going downstream. When you got big enough, you were allowed to turn back into the current and start working dry flies upstream. I always thought that grandpa made that rule to keep the kids dry. I'm starting to see an ulterior motive. We caught a lot of fish that way and learned the value of the swing. Well, guess what? I've used this swing. I've used uh, that method, uh, specifically on the Guadalupe, fishing the Guadalupana fishing fly. That, one, uh, that one's worked out really well uh, for yours truly, especially uh, on the Guadalupana for those trouts, or on the Guadalupe for trout. Uh, you cast, let that fly swing downward, 
uh, down current and as it finishes that swing and it starts popping back up at the end of the swing boom I was getting hit so um, I've experienced that one and that's one to keep in your back pocket the swing and fishing downstream okay number 52 doing the continental extreme short line nymphing has taken the fly fishing world by storm and for this we can thank international angling competitions generally known as the European method it evolved in Poland or the Czech Republic depending upon which branch of the Slavic kingdom you happen to be talking to the technique takes the rationale for shorter cast a giant leap farther to virtually no cast at all the whole idea is to get as close as possible to trout holding in deep currents which gives you a chance to maintain direct contact with the fly this means only six feet of leader starting with three times or three x and dropping quickly to five x and to no fly line outside the rod tip the notion is to position the rod perpendicular with the tip close to the water just above the prime holding lie when a trout bites you feel it no mistrikes here experts further emphasize this connection by leading the fly a ploy which line moves ever so slightly faster than the current enough to keep tight contact without compromising the natural drift tournament veterans say it also pays to give a series of quick hook sets when the fly enters a zone likely to hold fish don't worry too much about spooking fish as trout seldom flee to the other side of the river instead they typically move about 10 feet just about on target for your short line drift okay so um going continental european nymphing be it call it polish call it czech call it european it's continental give that one a try in fact i've seen heard as well as um noted some folks using this method uh with with some pretty good success so keep that in your back pocket all right let's go to tips 53 54 55 all talking weighty matters parts one two and three so let's start out with part one. On a typical spring day on Wyoming's North Platte River, wind ripped straight downstream hard enough to blow the horns off a goat. Would have been a sensational nymph bite for big rainbows suddenly went dead. It took a minute to understand the problem, but the solution was almost instantaneous. This downstream wind greatly accelerated the surface speed of the water, now rushing much faster than where the fly was located four feet below. The solution moved closer, and shorten the line, which was now possible because wind rippling the surface makes it difficult for a fish to see the angler. Then pinch on two or more BB sized split shot, the quickest and best way to slow the drift. The result, the bite immediately returned. Most nymph fishermen are minimalists when it comes to using lead, choosing the least amount to reach the desired depth. Trouble is, we waste much of the target zone waiting for the fly to sink. Instead, put on twice as much weight as you think you need. It may not be pleasant to cast, but it catches fish. All right, I, I understand that idea because if you put on, don't put on enough uh, weight or using the, the right weighted fly, uh, your, your fly doesn't stay in the zone long enough. And next thing you know, it's out of the zone and you only had a short period when the trout were able to, to, to maybe even think about striking it. So uh, I'm going to keep that in my back pocket. Okay, let's go to tip 54. Weighty matters part two. When conditions demand a presentation very close to bottom, don't be afraid to shorten the distance between the weight and the fly. Within reason, trout don't seem to care about this spacing and won't be spooked by the weight. The payoff comes in keeping your fly from floating up out of the zone where fish are holding. Trout are accustomed to a constant barrage of objects in drift. If they got put off by something as small as a split shot, they'd starve to death. All right, cool. All right, well, put on more weight. Don't worry about spooking them. Okay, uh, number 55, weighty matters part three. When current, wind, or any combination thereof conspire to keep you from an acceptable nymphing drift, there's one short sure cure. Add more weight. Think anvil. As one might imagine, heavy objects are resistant to being moved by water. The more weight you attach to your line, the slower it will move with a flow. All right, I'm not sure about putting a whole anvil on my line, but I definitely will keep that in my back pocket when it comes to getting that drift and making sure that I add more weight. So if it's not working, it's not getting any hits, back pocket, add more weight. Okay, so all for now, uh, let's go back and just recap what to anticipate for the next episode. Next episode, what we plan on doing is go through tips 56 through 61 specifically 
The difference between a good fisherman and a great one, A or BB. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll find out. 57, knockout with the bolo punch. 58, seeing the light. 59, the thin, clear line. 60, live with it. And 61, feeling skitterish. All righty. So that was pretty fun. Got some good information there. We'll keep it in my back pocket. And oh, by the way, hope uh, hope this format's working for some of y'all. So you don't just have to listen to someone talking. They got some of these videos over here. And in this case, all these were an awesome time out in the field being able to catch a fish or two. And hopefully we continue on with doing this format. And, you know, if, uh, if y'all are... Uh, liking what you see, let us know. And if uh, you have some suggestions, well, let us know as well. It's what the comments for are in the YouTube channel. For those on the iFish News Fishing Podcast, I think there's a way to comment there. If not, just go to the video and we'll get we'll get that comment as well. All right, so all for now. Next time, we'll catch y'all then. Good luck and good fishing. <laughs>